uh, GSA Regional Commissioner, Professional Services Category Executive, uh, Ms. Tiffany Hickson. Hi, everybody. Hi. Well, good morning. Um, oh, I sound very loud. Um, well, thank you for, for joining us. And we're really hoping that today's session is easy, light, a nice opportunity for us to um, really focus on what traditionally is thought of as you know, really change management um, and the barriers uh, that we face from a fear perspective uh, in getting through the change management process. So we've got a, a couple of um, activities that we'll go through and do some reporting out as a group, but really this is meant to be light and fun, um, no pressure, us not being talking heads. So hopefully Hopefully we can, we can achieve that this morning. Um, but I do think it's important for us to talk about uh, fear. I think it's a huge barrier in our organizations um, in terms of our ability to really get through the change management process. So this morning first, um, I'm going to start with introducing um, our, our panel members. And thank you ladies for, for joining us. Um, it was, it's nice to meet you in person. I've just been participating um, on, on the phone, um, given that I'm in Seattle. So we'll go ahead and start with you, Michelle. Hi. Do you want to introduce yourself? And one, we're each going to introduce ourselves and then talk about some of the, the fears and challenges uh, that we're facing in our organizations um, tackling the various change processes that we're going through. Excellent. Good morning. Hi, I'm Michelle Barr. Um, I work with the Housing and Urban Development. I'm a senior ITPM with them. Uh, how I got here, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I do actually every day deal with a lot of fear of change, fear of this is not the norm, trying to encourage people, okay, just move out of your box just a little bit. Look, you know, at not 50,000 feet, but maybe 5,000 feet. Get your, you know, kind of get your sea legs a little bit. Um, so when this opportunity to talk to you guys and help, design a, a program where we could look at fears and change and issues. It was really interesting to me. Good morning. I'm Isabella Darnell and I'm the Deputy CIO at the Department of Commerce. Uh, I've been at Commerce about five years and I guess one of the fears that I'll share with you was my coming to the Department of Commerce. I had spent many years at NASA and the Space Shuttle Program and I had the opportunity to serve as the shuttle transition manager and that had a lot of fears from a personal perspective because we were bringing uh, a very great program to an end and we had lots of people who were impacted by that and so my job was to help the agency transition people with various skill sets to new things some of the new things were outside of the agency plus dealing with tons and tons of infrastructure that we had all over the U.S. and internationally. Then I had an opportunity to come to the Department of Commerce. And that was another fear factor for me as an individual because working at NASA, we worked in a very team environment. And whether you were in Florida or Washington or Alabama or Texas, we all had this common thread of human spaceflight exploration. Then I came to Washington, D.C. to the Department of Commerce and the CIO shop. And there are 11 bureaus with 11 different mission <laughs> focuses. And I was asked to put some type of uh, governance structure in place to look at this huge IT portfolio uh, process that they had or did not have. And that was very frightening to me because A, I had not worked in an environment like commerce before, but here I am five years later, I am the deputy CIO, and I have a new boss, Steve Cooper, and he's there to transform us to 21st century IT, another fear factor, so I'll be happy to talk about <laughs> Good morning, I'm Pia Scott, and um, I count it an honor to be on the panel with these ladies. Um, I joined the federal government 15 years ago as a presidential management fellow. I'm also an act, IAC fellow, um, and it was really frightening for me to come from Montgomery, Alabama to Washington, D.C., and I thought about what is fear when I talked with David about fear factor, and so I Googled it, and I don't know if you all know this, but Fear Factor was on television twice. It first aired and only stayed on air for a couple of months and then it was canceled and then it came back. And I was like, what captivated the American audience? And what captivated us was that people would do outrageous things to achieve their objective. 
objective. And what was the objective? Of course, a monetary prize. But as civil servants and as industry leaders, what is our objective and what drives us and how do we push through that fear? And so when I thought about what is fear, I thought about America's most beloved president or one of the most beloved presidents, FDR, and says the only thing that we have to fear is fear itself. But then he continues, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, that we can't allow fear to impede us, to handicap us. So I was like, okay, Pia, don't let David down. What is fear? What is fear? And so I said, well, fear to me is fear is crippling. Fear is paralyzing. And I was like, but that's not true. That's not your core value. What is fear? And I remember the acronym that I know we, most of us know is fear is false evidence appearing real. So if it's false evidence appearing real, then it can't be crippling and it can't be paralyzing. It can be those things, but it also can be inspirational and motivating. And so I'm looking forward to today's activity to talk about fear and how we overcome those challenges to achieve what we must do as a nation to best serve our citizens and also be a global leader. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm Tiffany Hickson, um, and I currently work with the General Services Administration and have, have been there for I'm a little over three years, uh, for those of you I have not met before, and there are lots. Um, before that, I worked at the Department of Homeland Security, um, and before that, I worked for the Department of Commerce uh, for about 15 years. So, um, a, a lot of time spent um, almost all in acquisition, some on the program management side of the house. Um, but. Uh, ha have a, a lot of really great experience to bring to, to GSA and in my, my current role I'm responsible for pretty much changing everything uh, <laughs> in, in terms of how we are handling our professional services uh, contracts, how we manage them, what does that look like um, and I have really, in getting prepared for our discussion today I always underestimate um, how much fear actually plays into our decision making and what a serious barrier it is in getting through the change process. Um, you know, just my, my nature as a person is, you know, let's try it. What's the worst thing that could happen? Um, you know, for most of what we do, you know, we're buying stuff. Uh, we're not, you know, launching Scud missiles. We're, we're you know, life is not um, in the balance generally um, when, we're, when we're doing our contracts. So I always tend to lean forward and be very comfortable in in that space. Um, but uh, most people aren't. Um, and today, and I'm looking forward to our discussion just in terms of getting some tips for myself on uh, how to better manage the fears that the various um, stakeholders uh, that I work with, what they're facing. So um, I'm changing the way that we're engaging with industry and the kind of information uh, that we're providing um, to our customers about how industry prices their contracts. There's a huge amount of fear there. Um, and you know the message has been, we're so scared that we don't have all the answers that we're not going to move forward. Uh, for my employees, we are changing our org structure, we're changing who their bosses are, we are changing how they think about their work, um, and there's a lot of fear um, involved in implementing those changes. What does that mean for me in terms of how do I do my job? We're using a, a lot more um, IT and um, electronic platforms in terms of how we're communicating with industry, how we do our work, um, and there are real, real concerns from the staff about what is their value. Um, we even had a conversation this last week about how uh, their work was measured. Um, and for years, it has been about the production and not necessarily about the value. So when I mean production, is how many contracts did you get out the door? How long did it take you to do a mod? How many offers you know, do we have for, on the schedule side of the house um, in the hopper being re ready to process? And for me, I want us to start focusing on the quality of things. Um, how strong is your relationship with our industry partners? Do we really understand the pricing environment that we're coming from? And those are all skill sets that they really um, have not been measured against uh, and it really is you know rattling them in terms of you know what's the value that I really bring to this environment when it's been this other thing you know for the last 20 years. Um, so definitely looking forward to um, hearing your feedback um, about the, the challenges that you're facing and also really getting our arms around how to really address fear head on. Um, I, I agree with you that, you know, I, 
you know, fear is just a fear, it's just a word, it's just a perception, but in real life, it's a huge motivator um, right. for, you know, people's behavior. So, um, again, appreciate uh, the time that we're going to be spending on this uh, today. So I think I got through number one fairly successfully, so yay for me. I, I wasn't feeling too concerned about that. The next part I am a little concerned about. Uh, we're going to walk through um, just what the agenda is going to be for this morning. There's some instructions baked in here. Um, let's try not to focus too much on the process piece and really focus on you know, the discussion part of it. So the outcomes that we're hoping to get out of uh, this morning's session. Um, are, are you going to be Vanna? I thought I was going to get to walk those around. Okay, all right. Um, all right, so the outcomes that we have for this morning's session, um, and I guess I do have a fear I need reading glasses now. That's really <laughs> problematic. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you. I can't see far away. I can't see up close. It's all just a problem. Thank you so much. Oh, that's so much better. Okay. <laughs> I really, really need to stop by the drugstore on the way home. All right. All right, so outcomes for today's session. One, we want to recognize fears associated with innovation and common approaches uh, for uh, addressing them. Uh, we need to understand wide-ranging impacts and the usefulness of a comprehensive strategy uh, where innovation is concerned. Uh, one, we want to engage in a meaningful dialogue, and I really want us to focus on that piece of it, around innovation elements, uh, including but not limited to communities of practice, uh, design for evolution, dialogue between inside and outside, different levels of organizational <coughs> participation, public and private spaces, focus on value, uh, you get the idea. Um, second, we really want the focus to discussion around what doesn't work, um, admiring the problem, competitions, collaboration, innovation centers, culture change, that kind of thing. And also we want the discussion to focus around what does work. Um, the thinking design, uh, innovation process, that kind of thing. So one, really let's focus on having a meaningful dialogue around how fear um, blocks uh, our, our innovation and change in our organizations. Two, let's talk about what doesn't work. And three, let's talk about what does work. Okay. Was that good, David? That was David gave me very specific instructions about this. So, all right. Um, thank you for that affirmation. That was good. All right. Um, so um, we are going to walk through. Um, do you want to go over that this sure. part of it? Okay. Thank you. Okay. That would be helpful. So for for this part, and see, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. All right. Great. So for this part, we uh, we have a bowl of scenarios. Okay. So we're going to need one person from each table to be the designated person to come and pick from the fear bowl. And this, it, it, inside, uh, inside you're going to find uh, uh, a small box, and you're going to open the box, and the box is going to have basically a scenario on it. So you're going to read that to your table, and then you're, you're, the goals are basically to discuss, okay, what is this person going through? What are some of the fears that this person is probably experiencing in this scenario? And you really kind of have to read the scenario to understand it. And then, uh, you know, how can we start talking about how to mitigate some of these fears? So we've got folks that are, our, our speakers are going to be joining you at the tables. We've also got various moderators throughout the room. We've got Lou, Kurt, Jake. Um, and so, you know, this is going to be fun. <laughs> so let's let's take, like, let's, let's not get too stressed out. And, you know, everybody can take, like, you know, 10 seconds and choose someone from the table who's going to be the person to come up and choose from the terrifying bowl of fear. <laughs> We're about ready to get to the point where we're kind of briefing out some of our discussions so we can kind of take something away from it, right? So there's actually nine scenarios that we've prepared, so we don't actually know which ones you guys have. So I'm going to go through, but each, each scenario has a number on it. So I think the way that we're going to look at it is we're going to kind of say, does anyone have a number one? Does anyone have a number two? And then we're going to kind of, for each number, we're going to put it up on the, on the board here. And then we're going to ask someone from the applicable table, kind of get up and talk about some of the, some of the fears. Some, well, first of all, we need somebody to kind of describe the situation, right? Um, then kind of give an overview of some of the fears that your table, your table identified, if you have any specific scenarios that are, you know, that were brought up that, uh, that you could share with the group, I think that would be very helpful. Um, and then also, what are some of the mitigating strategies that we can take away from this? And so what we're going to do is we're going to try to assemble some of those fears and mitigations and, you know, use them to kind of 
put together a takeaway that we can that we can use going forward with act diac work. So with that, does anybody have a number one? Are you sure you don't want to do the part that we didn't talk about? Oh, okay. Which I'm was sorry. Right. We, we also talked about having you act out your persona. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe it's too late in the game for that. So if anyone's no. feeling, <laughs> if anyone's feeling act particularly it out. ambitious. Yeah. <laughs> If anyone is feeling particularly ambitious, if you want to stand up and say, I am this person, and let me tell you about my horribly frustrating scenario, we won't stop you. So with that, does anybody have scenario number one? Number two? OK. Both? All right. So let's go ahead and start over here. I'm going to put scenario number two up on the board. And can someone from here kind of here? I'll give you the microphone and kind of give an overview of the scenario for everybody. Okay. Morning, everyone. My name is JD. I'm from Bloomberg Government. Uh, scenario two is basically we are Sheila. I myself, I'm not Sheila. <laughs> but we are we are Sheila collectively, and we have a sizable team on an existing contract, and we've been asked to basically do more with less, uh, innovate in this work. Quote. The fear stems from a lack of clarity, uncertainty. What does the customer want? How does this impact the mission? How does this drive the mission forward? Um, and basically, we thought that we could get to the bottom of this fear by making this interpersonal issue. So having trust, asking those difficult questions, um, and being honest with the customer and honest with your team. Another way to mitigate this fear is to bring people in so there's a sizable team in this environment. Um, don't make this a, a one person's kind of responsibility. Bring in key stakeholders on that team. Get feedback along the way. Um, basically, in an agile methodology, ask for feedback before you put out the finished product and iterate on, on uh, multiple um, kind of phases throughout that, that process. Um, team, anything else we want to add here? Let's give, uh, let's give the other table a chance. Okay. Let me uh, find that enemy that might be able to take you. Here you go. Thank you. Well, I'm uh, Claudio Borgiotti. So we had the same scenario. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. and, and of course, uh, JD and uh, those folks had the opportunity to speak first. We had a lot of the same uh, views of the situation. Uh, clearly, we need to define what innovation means. Right? We need to have an understanding so that our constituents can appreciate what we do. And so we want to make sure we capture that. Uh, part of that also involves communication, making sure that we have top cover, understanding that not only do we need to hear what we need to deliver, but we also need to understand from a management uh, perspective that is consistent with the, those uh, situations. And so that was one of the things that we wanted to uh, make sure we captured as a, as a potential fear, but then also how we addressed it. Uh, within an established team, uh, we, we wondered about how people would feel about their role in an innovation uh, situation. Right? What is going to happen to me? Uh, if my, my organization changes, if uh, my job changes. Uh, and so we wanted to try to make sure that, again, we have consistent communication as a means to help that along and, and manage that for, for folks. Um, another challenge was, that, again, it was a little bit ambiguous as to what it was that we were supposed to innovate. So uh, one of the things we said is we want to make sure we have something that we can measure. Right? How and what are we going to measure, either incrementally or as a whole, in terms of the delivery of the innovation. And part of that is, uh, having good communication, again, making sure that that uh, happens on a consistent basis. Uh, ensuring that we have consensus amongst the team and the delivery uh, opportunities. Uh, how and what we need to focus on. What are we going to find as the right increments of a delivery to be able to der derive value immediately and start to show that as quickly as possible and then thinking about trying to be agile uh, in, the, in the, uh, our delivery. Uh, um, will I have top cover, again, communication uh, with uh, management and executive uh, level uh, organizations, uh, and then how to use your budget or lack of budget effectively, and making sure that we prioritize and measure things that are going to uh, give impact quickly, right, and understand that the, the more you can show uh, in short order, the better it's going to be in the long term. Uh, I think that uh, mostly covers it. Did that say anything? Great. Okay. Thank you. I had a quick question about, and I heard this in a couple of different, at least a couple of the different tables. Has anybody's organization defined what innovation means for their organization? Anybody? Okay. W would you mind sharing that? Um, innovation requires context, and so innovation changes depending on the outcome you want. Is it innovation for performance? Is it innovation for productivity? Is it innovation for cost savings? If you don't, if you don't define 
Hello. Yeah. Oh, hello. Do I have to repeat that whole thing? Do I need a microphone? No. Innovation is, a, is an exercise in rethinking an outcome. So we have to start with the outcome. Is the outcome productivity? Is the outcome cost savings? If, if the outcome is just doing it a different way, what's the point? And so we always work backward from what is the desired outcome and what is the innovation category? And then we always start with the question, so what does great look like to achieve that outcome? Who's doing it now? And what's never been done at all? Those are the, it's very simple for us. We ask those questions. That's all I have to do. Well, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, did anybody have scenario number three? Number four? Number five. It's like bingo. <laughs> Number six. All right. Uh, uh, uh. I am right. Except I'm older than right. Oh, did you read this? I don't want to read <laughs> can you can you give us a summary of, of Ray's situation? You've been embodying Ray for the past twenty minutes. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, I am Ray. I'm a mid-level professional, four-year-old program manager. Well, oh, four years. <laughs> I was on track for the senior executive service, but lately I haven't been selected to lead any new projects. My leadership only asked me to work on existing and sunsetting projects instead of exciting new ones. Uh, my agency is doing. In meetings. Nobody asked for my opinion or any of my suggestions. Well, I volunteer information. Some of my colleagues just look at me with that smile. Uh, and the millennial employees interrupt me all the time and they break apart all the stuff where I think it's a good thing because I usually didn't include uh, My leadership constantly embraces the millennials, uh, their recommendations, but not mine. And in, in this kind of new situation, failure is encouraged and my track record is dismissed as antiquated. Uh, and then what happened to investment review boards and uh, project plans, cross-functional teams, and some of the protocol gone. And now my boss wants me to uh, translate emails that have things like DM, FW, IW, OMG, and WTF. <laughs> 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 uh, and it's a I, I never even thought this would ever happen to me, but it, it seems like this, you know, he endorses this whole new thing without even understanding what it is. And I never thought that this would happen, you know, at a time when my experience and my credentials just don't seem to matter, and I just feel like the old guy in the room, the dinosaur. Uh, many of my colleagues have stalled out in their career, but I still want to do something with mine. So that's, that's right. So what we came up with is, fear is usually about the unknown. I'm speculating because of the way that people are talking to me or treating me that they feel like it. So the first step is go find out if it's true. Do the millennials really not believe that I've done anything with my career that what I have is not relevant? Does my boss really not trust me to manage projects anymore because I can't connect with the sort of next generation? And if that's true, while well, scary, at least it gives me a plan to go figure out what to do next. Whether that what to do next is close the gap between what I can do and what I can't, or what I believe in what I don't, or it's time for me to move on to an organization that would better appreciate my skills. So clearly I don't fit the current <coughs> culture. So has the culture changed or have I changed or do we both need to change? I think are the questions that we thought we needed to not answer. Uh, <coughs> and I needed to talk to outside mentors, the people who share these opinions of me, if those are more relevant, and just develop a plan to address it one way or another. Yeah. Okay, that's it. That's it. Very good. Okay. Well, that, I mean, does anybody else have any anything? Does this resonate with anyone else? Anyone else have any thoughts that they want to add before we move on to the next one? Well, I was actually wondering. I mean, I, that's real. I mean, that's happening every single day in our organization. And do you think your solutions actually help? I mean, in terms of really addressing. You know, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Boss is boss is boss. Ray's boss is really a carrier of a lot of defaults here. What is the culture of the organization? If you're going to take the culture into we want everyone to be heard and everyone has a voice and every voice matters, mm -hmm. then every voice should matter. And, you know, the thing about 
this situation is clearly no one's working together. Right? And so doing this, look at this team. The entire capital of this organization walks on two feet. It's the sole capital base. And yet, they're not really maintaining that capital base. What you have here is, is people who need to have relationships. And relationships, in my opinion, are based on two things, and two things only, trust and communication. They don't trust Ray. Ray doesn't trust them. And when he does communicate, because they don't trust him, it doesn't plan. And if, he, if they did trust him and he didn't communicate, they wouldn't hear it. So they have to work as an organization on building trust, on ensuring that the young guys and women get hurt, and that Ray's, I'm sure, wise experience in counsel is, is a valuable asset for those who have those sort of innovative ideas. Once people start to trust each other, it changes its significance. All right, Great. thank you. Thank you. All right, did anybody have scenario number seven? <laughs> number eight? Okay, both, both tables there? Yeah. All right, good, we have a lot to talk about. Can I borrow your pen? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna give you the mic. We came up with a lot. A lot. A lot. So this, um, you've all seen the uh, ads, teasers for new television programs ripped from the headlines. Well, this, this, ours is ripped from the everyday. Uh, imagine yourself as a contract you know, in an agency. You get an email, and the email comes from the boss's boss's boss. And it says, we need to make sure that we have innovation in our contracts going forward. Make it happen. And that's about it. That's about it. So uh, what do you do when you're in that situation? First of all, your, your fear is that I've already got this workload. In fact, the scenario talks about I've got a workload that's mounting now, and, and the fourth quarter is going to be a killer. Uh, so I don't have any time to think about this. That's, your, that's one fear. Uh, and how am I going to be innovative? And when, we, when, the, when the table thought about, so what motivates a contracting officer? What motivates you is, uh, first of all, is my contract going to be considered to be fair, or is it going to be protested? It doesn't, those two are not exclusive, by the way. Uh, and secondly, is the internal client going to be happy with the, the choice that we make and, and the RFP that comes out? Uh, that's really the underlying fear you have, because then your fear is that if I'm going to get promoted, I need to make sure I have a good track record. So all those things come into play as you're trying to deal with this, this ambiguous uh, solution. And one of the, of course, one of the mitigation strategies is ask for guidance, but we didn't, we, we, we assumed for a minute that everybody else was really busy too. So you didn't, you're not going to get that guidance. So uh, what are you going to do about that? How do you mitigate that situation so that you can at least comply with the intent, which you understand the intent, but nobody seems to be able to identify and, and define innovation. Uh, you ask your industry partners, uh, and they say, well, we, we're innovative. Look at this we have. We have tool X. That's innovative. And another one has tool Y. That's, that's their definition that they're bringing to you. So you don't, you're not getting a lot of help from them. So what are some of the things that we can be doing? Um, and how do I learn, you know, how do I take into account maybe new contracting techniques and, and what am I willing to take a risk on? So a couple of things that we really think we can, uh, we can do to mitigate the situation. First of all, the most important per person is your internal client. In this case, whichever mission organization is wanting that RFP, wanting that statement of work. So let's go back to them and do two things. One is, let's have some specific questions to ask them. Don't ask them, what do you mean by innovation? Ask them specific questions about, what do you want to see in three years in this contract? What do you want to see in five years in this contract? Specific questions you can potentially write into the RFP. Secondly, you can ask, uh, you can make sure they understand what you're doing so you have that executive sponsorship from their organization that gives you some cover. At the same time, you need to let your boss Boss of boss, what you're doing too, so you can have this is how I'm defining this and how I'm going about this. This takes some of that fear away from you, so you're a little more free to do what you want to do. And then uh, you can start doing some innovative things like thinking uh, from, from a contract perspective. If I'm going to ask for innovation, am I going to score it, evaluate it? If so, how? Am I going to, how am I going to price it? Is it going to be firm fixed price? Do I want to do it TNM or cost plus? Maybe some cost sharing, if it's cost plus cost sharing with the vendors so that the vendors incentivize the innovation, but I get some benefit out of it too as a government. So those type of things you can do, but you're a little more freedom of action if you've got that executive sponsorship and you have also your management buy-in. Uh, and you can also then have an industry day, and I know this would be a shocking and, and 
unusual situation, have an industry day where you actually ask the industry to give you some feedback as opposed to just, as from the government, just giving uh, feedback. So for instance, asking the industry one particular, uh, uh, give me one, one way that you would define and or see the innovation evaluated in this, in this criteria. Bring that back and see what you have. Now, you may do all of that, you may still get a protest because that's not uncommon in this day. But you'll be on, this, on the way of having a fair and equitable uh, and open competition. And I think that really is, it will be how you track where it is assessed. So those are the things, and, and I asked the team, did I capture most of it? Is there anything else I need to bring up? Let's see, let's see what the other, let's okay. see what the other table has to say. Yep. Thank you. Tony Celeste with uh, Brocade. I'm not, I don't think I need this. So, um, so uh, I guess uh, you already heard about a run, contract specialist, Q3, Q, Q4, already has like 12 different acquisition requirements on their plate that they need to get done, and they're expecting a bunch, uh, they're expecting a bunch more for the uh, uh, fourth quarter. So right off the bat, I got to give my team, my group here a big hand, because we've got more notes <laughs> up there than anybody else. <laughs> But the fears that this individual is facing is how do I get this done? So I've already got acquisitions, 12 on my plate, that I'm being expected to go out and source for uh, mission teams or program teams. And those requirements are already defined. And I'm now being asked to ensure that they all have innovation. But now I've either got to go back to them and make that happen. So. But I also know I've got a bunch more coming. So some of the, the, the ways we thought that we could mitigate uh, that risk and that comfort was getting more involvement early in the process with the, the, by increased collaboration, leveraging the IPTs, more advanced planning on what was going on, what are you guys working on, what's going to be coming my way, so that we can start to get more innovation. Then to look at Hey, where is it we want to spend our time for the innovation? Is it is it in the section C in the requirements, or is it really in how we're going to evaluate and what it is we're going to look at and the bids that we're coming in? So do we need to spend more time trying to write innovation into the requirements or into how we're going to evaluate? And so uh, arming ourselves with a set of questions that we ask the organization that helps to link to what their the desired outcome is and how that outcome is linked to improving the agency's mission. So whether it's improving services uh, to, to citizens, if it's benefiting the veterans or the warfighter, whatever, whatever that might be. So linking those things in. Um, in terms of you know, most of what we've heard, you know, the fears were all similar. The protests, uh, the overwhelming workload that's there, the how do I get others engaged in this, this direction came late. So I, I think the, all of that was covered. But those were some of the uh, highlights of, of what we came up with as a group. So just for everybody, any, anything else? Good? Okay, great. Thank you. I probably don't need, probably don't need um, all right, so I'm assuming that you guys are there or not. All right, so you guys want to set up from what the microphone is going to be able to do that. I'll wait. I'm going to introduce my son. I'm going to start and I'll start taking my name. I have two more questions. UCIO, large federal agency, or I have a full customer service, and I'm not going to have this stuff. We have no budget. Sector is supposed to transform ourselves in the 21st century. Um, as I said, we have no budget. All the bureaus have their own separate budgets. Um, and we want to come to care for them. Alright, so we came up with not necessarily your four nine fears, the mitigation that go with it. <laughs> okay, so first is lack of control. Um, obviously, if it's not your separate budgets, there's control issues. So we thought the best thing to do is think that we do have control. Let's think about 
under our control, the entire community council, make them accountable. Try to get the people that not only work for us, um, because I didn't mention a lot of our executives get elected for German average wage, whatever. So it's a great thing to start with. First of all, you walk into a pretty tough situation, like this contract job, or I'm trying to get So we want to find that with mentors, coaches, and people within the agency, and also your stakeholders. That was part of the uh, overall uh, strategy. Engage early and often with stakeholders. Try to get management to define your expectations. Uh, credibility is another fear we have. How do you get credibility? So we have holding off sites with staff, again, with stakeholders. Getting the wind, getting some quick wind. Find what we want to do. Find what the 21st century is meant by the century. Figure it out. Um, mm -hmm. Here in the end, you know, See, I got all my work done. Uh, design deliverable, set up success metrics. Another group mentioned that. Have, what is the commitment of success? Once you know what the 21st century looks like, how do you get it? Uh, lack of legacy and knowledge. <coughs> You're brand new. You've lost a lot of your unique executive uh, staff, so how do you figure out what it is you've got? Um, again, we'll provide you with the group. Get ready to roll for this week. You can't stay at that high level. At least there's a good thing that you can understand where you work, how to mitigate it, what the problems are to get to the next level. Last part of the thing once we have defined the four things that we've dealt with the 21st century, figure out what are the top three things that you want to get accomplished in that program. Um, crowdsourcing is something that we've got to do. But I'm excited to do that. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. It was good. I, I thought maybe I'd share, and the rest of the panel too can share maybe their observations in terms of takeaways. And you all have other takeaways that would be good to contribute those as a group. Um, but what struck me across the discussions is do we really have a, we focus a lot on the people and the individual personas, and it's their fears that are blocking us from change. And, you know, really the takeaway for me was, hmm. Not really sure if it's a people issue. Um, I think it's really a leadership issue. Um, you know, a lot of the the larger barriers that we talked about. Um that folks were trying to overcome really were driven by lack of definition in terms of what are we really trying to accomplish? What is the level of risk? And, and when I say what we're trying to accomplish, no, really, specifically, you know, what are those things that we're trying to accomplish? And from a leadership perspective, I think that's really, you know, our job uh, to be able to tell our employees this is what, you know, we're, we're, we want to accomplish. Two, what's the level of risk that we're willing to take? Um, three, how do our employees support us um, in and achieving those goals in a meaningful way. And I don't think, I know that I probably, I will all just own it myself, um, could spend more time um, in that space and really working to better articulate, you know, those kind of high level strategic objectives of the organization. Um, I also kind of took away from most of the groups, talked a little bit about um, Encouraging people to go find mentors. Um, well, we as leaders have to invest time in being mentors. Um, if everyone needs to go find a mentor, um, either we've got a, a training issue, we're not developing our staff um, as well as we could be um, as individual people, not just the did someone go to an acquisition course, a program management course, a contracting course, that kind of thing. <coughs> so um, really for me, that's also a leadership thing. We probably need to invest more ourselves uh, in being those mentors and being more attached to people as people, um, in addition to really addressing more specifically kind of the broader strategic, what are we trying to do? Um, only one group had innovation as even, or one organization even defined what innovation is. Um, what's the level of risk you're willing to take? You know, that kind of thing. So just in terms of themes, those were some of the things that I heard. LPM. Anybody else? I've heard, I've heard the same thing, but what was fascinating about the group that I was working with is that everybody decided not to be paralyzed by fear. They decided mm -hmm. to jump in and solve the problem. 
And so they didn't take time to pause and was like, but what's the fear? What's the fear? Really pushing them to identify the fear because they wanted to solve the problem. Because mm -hmm. I think they're committed to being professionals who achieve that objective. So mm -hmm. that, that was shocking. Like there was no time for pause to say, what am I scared of? Or maybe we should be scared. I mean, honestly, sometimes, you know, really understanding those risks, right, are important. So one question I always have, I think it's very relevant today, especially with the media we have, it's accountability. Whenever you see people on the Hill, it's, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know what was going on in this agency or that agency or my program or not. So how does accountability play into this is a really interesting question, because we all should be accountable and proud of the things that we take on. But on the converse, when things do go south, it's stepping up and, you know, really mitigating that fear of, well, people are going to see me as a failure, where, you know, there are growth opportunities that can come from that. Yeah, I think one group in the, in the back, they didn't talk about it, but they also talked about really that leadership piece. Again, is executive <laughs> sponsorship. Somebody's accountable, someone's going to provide cover, someone's the one that's really responsible um, for, you know, laying out those goals. Yeah. On, on the leadership, we all talk about strategy and the objectives talked about the what. But people don't follow us for the what. They, they don't buy what we do, they buy what we do. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get that invested in people, if you don't give them something bigger than themselves to belong to, mm -hmm. I'm sure everybody here has been in an organization like that. Anybody ever been in the military? Put in the Marines in there? Mm -hmm. I don't know why is a Marine never lose a fight? Not because he's the toughest guy, because he doesn't want to be the first one to let the Marine Corps down. When you create that environment as a leader for people, you can be the guy who wins every fight. And you do that by communicating, telling them why, being vulnerable, which is really tough, mm -hmm. setting the example, and being accountable. Not to Congress yesterday, but to them. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I think we've just about hit our time. I really appreciate everybody coming and being so participating and active and contributing. So actually, and I'd like to give kind of a round of applause to our, our speakers.